have declared they're open for business. Although reviled by many Western nations as a brutally repressive regime, Burma was recently given the chance to fashion a more cooperative image when it played host to the region's economic leaders. It was clear many Asian leaders were more than happy to overlook the country's democratic failings and talk business, not politics. What will you be saying about Burma on the issue of, of um, forced labour, those very questions? Well, I, don't think, uh, I don't think that uh, that's, uh, that's going to be an issue here. Why not? Well, why? Why should it be? Human rights were not on the agenda at this gathering of Burma's military elite and Asian leaders. <laughs> The region's economic ministers preferring to do business than create enemies amongst near neighbours. I have seen with, with my own experiences that the moment an economy gets to be more open, uh, human resources could be, could be developed. Uh, automatically the society would be uh, uh, looking for, for, for larger uh, participation anyway. And, and, and I think this is healthy for, for the country. From inside the heart of the Defence Ministry, Burma's most senior military leader, Kim Yunt, greets economic ministers from the region's most powerful nations, China, Japan and South Korea. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a rare audience in the most secretive ministry. In return, the generals hope for the recognition and support they desperately crave to remain in power. The military is one of the country's only growth industries. In the past decade, it has grown from strength to strength. From 200,000 troops to more than 400,000 today. Hated and distrusted by many Burmese, the ruling generals march to their own beat, their power now firmly entrenched. I mean, uh, we have been in, in, in power because it was, it is necessary. We are trying to, you know, we are trying to uh, loosen up. How many ministers are not military? Uh, there are about eight of them. Eight. How many ministers are there? Pardon? Altogether, 30. It's, it, it looks like the military has a very strong hold here. Yeah, but you know, we are, most of us are in the reserve. We are resigned. We are pensioned. We are in the reserve. I can, I can you know, I can put on a civilian dress and say, I'm Mr. Abel. I'm, I'm Uebel. That you are sitting here in military uniform. You see, because I'm in the reserve. Ten years ago, the people of Burma went to the polls. The military was told in no uncertain terms it was no longer wanted. 87% of the population voted against the armed forces. It was a landslide win to the National League for Democracy, led by Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi. But the generals refused to hand over power, and a decade later, they continued to restrict and watch her every movement. The years have not diminished her conviction, the message remains the same. What we want is for the international community to indicate clearly that an illegal regime which has taken over the power of government by force should not be encouraged to stay on and oppress the people. But despite international pressure to accept the democratic decision of its people, the generals have held on to power by generating a culture of fear. In Rangoon, they say in any gathering of three people, two may well be intelligence officers. 20 kilometres outside of the capital, Langtaya Township is not where most of its residents would prefer to live. The military made that decision for them. Langtaya is by no means an isolated example. High up in this mountain valley, these farmers have just arrived. A three-day journey to a new life at the whim of an unsympathetic regime. 
Each time, the regime's reasons for moving people on may be different, but the outcome remains the same. Burma's leaders stand by their actions. If they are being relocated for their own benefit, yeah, for, the, for their own welfare, for their own benefit, for their own uh, better quality of life, why not? It shows that Burma is a, a country where individual freedom does not exist, where people can be made to go where they do not want to go by those who are in power. The people in Leng Taya have had to start again from nothing. A small loans program channeled through one of the few international aid organisations operating inside Burma provided the start-up capital for this charcoal-making business. These front room enterprises are labelled grassroots aid. They're how foreign governments channel their aid into Burma without directly dealing with the regime. Up until now, the Australian government has banned direct aid to the regime, imposed sanctions on military sales and not encouraged trade, a position at odds with Asian leaders more prepared to engage with the military. The family visit, the, the, the family comes While nations the, debate about how to influence change, the International Red Cross has been quietly making moves. It's returned to Rangoon and negotiated to get inside the nation's notorious prisons. Political prisoners are now allowed to see their family members face to face for the first time in years. Up to now we have been to uh, 26 prisons. Uh, we, roughly, we have seen more than 30,000 inmates in all these places of detention, and among them, more than 1,600 security detainees. Simply seeing the prisoners is one thing, but have you been able to affect any real change? Oh, it, there are many, many things, but then we enter in the part, normally, that I cannot uh, disclose, because the rule is quite clear. We can say what we do, but not what we see. But at the same time, I think for these um, security detainees to have somebody from the outside, outside the country who is able to see them, to register them, it's also a kind of protection for them. In this part of the world, how big a deal is it? I think it is. I think it's a big deal and it's, uh, yeah, it's something. But this is one bright spot in a dismal picture on human rights. Foreign investors continue to shun Burma because of its bad image. Australian publisher Ross Dunkley hopes he will make a change. Kitty art, fun and games. You know, we're still refining uh, the content of the, of the paper. He freely admits having friends Sorry. in high Sorry, places is the good. only way yeah, to Roger. do business in Burma. You open the pages up here for me. The concept and the approval for this has come from the very top, no doubt about it. His joint venture partner is the son of a very senior Burmese military leader. But don't expect any stories about politics anytime soon. Politics? Is that an area that you can cover? I think one of the things that I'm very careful not to cover is politics. Have you written anything about Aung San Suu Kyi in the paper at all, about the opposition at any stage? No. When do you see that you could? When the government sees it as appropriate. While isolation and sanctions have hit the people they're meant to help the hardest, foreign aid or foreign involvement continues to be closely watched. The belief holds firm among many nations that sanctions and isolation will ultimately achieve their aims. Sanctions as part of a regime of international pressure on Burma are effective. It's the pressure itself that's effective and sanctions are a part of that. But the key step, and the one that we all are pressing for and waiting for, is dialogue. The, the military regime has to 
engage in serious dialogue with the Democratic opposition, if they take that one move, then I think anything can happen. They take that one move, they one might move. lose power. Well, they, they're, they're not a legitimate government. Military is not supposed to be running a, con a country. They should be running the military. Up until now, few Western governments have been prepared to directly engage Burma's military. But that appears to be changing. In the capital, quiet diplomacy has been at work. Australia has broken ranks with the isolationists and agreed to fund training courses in human rights. It's a significant shift in Australia's approach to a reviled regime. But it's a move that has angered opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi. What they seem to be considering is a course for foxes to guard the hen coop because these so-called human rights training courses are for civil servants. And uh, it's actually people who will be picked by the authorities. And it's precisely these people who are oppressing us and violating human rights in Burma. The authorities are not ignorant of the fact that they don't give people a fair trial. They don't give people any trial at all. Quite often they simply arrest our people and then put them into prison. No trial, no access to counsel, not even access to the families until they've actually been sentenced to prison. They're not unaware of that. Up until now, Western nations have demanded political change as a precondition for aid. Australia is making no demands, but Aung San Suu Kyi's faith that sanctions will ultimately bring change remains undiminished. I wouldn't call it the big stick approach. I would call it just standing firmly by certain principles, such as that human rights violations are not acceptable and should not be rewarded. Uh, what is there to reward the, the military authorities for? This is, this is how we see it. 